All right. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining today. Uh, some basic housekeeping first. Uh, while we're using Zoom webinars, please direct all of your questions to the Q and A section. Uh, the chat won't be monitored. The Q and A really is where we can ask questions, and then you can upvote the questions that you think are relevant that you're experiencing that others are experiencing. Um, other things, if you have any audio issues, you know, please let me know. That would be a good thing to ping on chat. And um, since we have a small group today, we may go ahead and do some interaction where I can unmute you and let you talk. Um, this is the third part in a three-part series. Uh, we'll cover that here in the presentation in a minute. So we've covered Terraform, we've covered Ansible, and now we're getting into CI Pipeline. So things are going to get a little bit uh, uh, more complicated. Not everyone's as far along with this, so expected attendance to be lower this time. Uh, for me, you're, you're seeing there's no digital background. Uh, my, my application actually crashed and won't work. So we're going to go low key today. You actually get to see where, where I live. Um, and you may hear some background noise, hopefully not. So let's kick off the presentation and we'll get going. So the agenda today, we're going to focus on why CI CD. CI is continuous integration. CD is continuous delivery or deployment. Uh, Jenkins is what we'll be using today, but it's not the tool you have to use. There are other things that would achieve the same outcome. But I'll tell you why I chose Jenkins and how we're going to leverage it in our labs. Um, pipelines and webhooks, what are they? Why are they necessary? And then our build environments, right? Your build environment is going to be very different than what your developer may be using, so it's important to understand the differences. And then finally, F5 automation and orchestration tool chain. Uh, we do have some registrants today that have not attended the first or second webinar, and so it's important for everyone to understand what is it we're leveraging in this automation and in these pipelines to really allow us to achieve the automation of our big IP in our environment. And then what everyone probably wants to see is the demo, right? And we'll be honest, guys, this is a work in progress. So uh, hopefully the demo gods are with us and it will work. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Now today's session will be shorter than some of the past, primarily because we're leveraging a tool that does a lot of the work for us. So with Ansible and Terraform, there was a lot of buildup we had to do, right? We had to cover basics. We had to go through what were some of the things we need in our environment. Now we're kind of to the point where we get to see the outcome of the first two webinars. So definitely a lot of time for Q&A, and maybe I can give you a few minutes back towards the end. So if you're new to the series, this is a three part. We've been doing one every month. Um, we were starting with automation of the big IP using Ansible. Why Ansible? Because for me and for a lot of my colleagues, uh, we see Ansible as one of the widely or one of the top used automation tools in our customer accounts. Um, it is extremely powerful and it's very good at uh, configuration management. And then the session two was really about infrastructure as code. And this is where we start to talk about Terraform and why Terraform versus Ansible. And then today we're going to talk about automating via the CI pipelines, and you'll actually see us pull the two together. We will use Terraform and Ansible. We'll explain why we think using both is, is the best method. Pardon me, the best method. So why CI CD? Um, if you've seen some of the, especially the first webinar, you heard me talk about the automation lifecycle. For a lot of the people I work with, their target is starting with the application, right? How do I automate the app? How do I deal with deploying the app? When in reality, we should take a step back and we have to look at the full life cycle of the environment. So from a big IP perspective and even an app, that's the building of the app and the bootstrapping of the image, deploying the app into the environment, obtaining monitoring telemetry data from the application, and then finally change, right? So for example, if I need to scale, or I need to change a security policy, right? These are the things that we're trying to do by an automation process. For me, <clears throat> we've covered some of these aspects using Ansible and Terraform, but that change, that's really where something like a CI pipeline starts to shine because my developers can take that telemetry data and say, ooh, I need to tweak this, or maybe we should change the logic here, and they can deploy a new version of that app. Now, when we talk about deployments, when we're really talking about developers and deployments, we're, we're really past the days of waterfall development, right? Many of us grew up in that era where we wrote an app for several weeks or months, and then it was eventually pushed out to our customers. For our big IP customers today, you're probably familiar with waterfall in the sense that big IP is released twice a year. That is a waterfall development process. Essentially, there's a lot of code that's grouped together and it's released every couple of months. Now, 
That's not to say the big IP components themselves aren't moving from waterfall to agile. They are. And more and more of our customers are doing the same thing, moving from large monolithic apps to smaller applications, even to microservices, and using agile development processes to achieve this. So the goal is to move faster and faster and faster. And to do that, we have to release constantly. And this is where that change, that loop back comes into play. Now my developers can take that information, update new code, and then I can either redeploy my environment or I can update my environment. So in today's demo, we're, we're actually just going to update. We'll, we'll work through how to deploy it. And in your environment, you can make that decision, right? Do I do blue green? Do I do canary? And we'll touch on some of those deployment methods as we continue. So for those that are new, CI stands for continuous integration. Uh, as a former developer, when I think CI, CI was how I was doing testing, right? So it allows developers to work together on projects and ensure that code meets sprint requirements, right? So this is typically referred to in Agile, we typically work on a sprint, right? So this is a user story that tells me what I need to be writing towards and what I need to be focusing on. It also ensures developers don't break existing uh, unit tests. So I was really big on test-driven uh, development. And what that allowed me to do is someone would tell me, hey, this is a feature that we want in the product. Instead of me going off and trying to figure out what that should be, coming back in a week or so and them saying, yeah, that's not what I intended, right? Then I just wasted a week. Instead, you would write unit tests that would say, hey, maybe we're building a registration form. And this registration form needs to take a name, a phone number, an email address, and then register them for the actual newsletter. And so a unit test would say, is this form actually taking a name? Is that a valid input? Is the form taking an email address? Can I register the user for the newsletter? And the unit test allowed me to ensure the code that I'm writing is always correct. Now there's other benefits of unit testing. Unit testing also allows me to say, when someone finds a bug in a registration form, they're like, hey, wait a minute, uh, the phone number is actually not accepting a valid phone number, right? So I can go back into my code and go, ooh, I'll add a unit test for that. And next time we won't have this issue. So I'm always failing forward. I'm ensuring that any bugs or issues we find in production never creep back into my code base. Because in large projects, you're gonna have a lot of developers that are all working on the project at the same time. And if we really wanna start getting to the point that we're doing multiple deployments a day, we have to get to a standardized testing framework that allows me to ensure that my code didn't break someone else's. Um, this is heavily used in Agile development processes, uh, and more than likely, guys, this is already deployed in your environments. Uh, if you're using GitLabs, this is already there. It's part of it. If your company isn't, maybe you're a Confluence shop. Um, you know, they have their equivalent of this. Um, but we'll be using Jenkins because it's a very popular open source, and it's extremely extensible. So then the second part of CICD, which is continuous delivery or continuous deployment. So why the two different uh, names? Well, continuous delivery is typically what most people start, and, and it's the initial goal. So when I used to write Java applications, right, the Java application would be compacted or essentially zipped up into a war file. And that war file is what we were trying to always build so the ops team could then go deploy that on our Tomcat and servers. So continuous delivery meant that I was able to continuously build the most up-to-date war file so that the operations team could go grab that at any point in time. If you've been playing with our ANO tool chain, then continuous delivery is us delivering AS3 or declarative onboarding to you via GitHub. Inside of the distribution folder, you see the latest version and you see the long-term support. That's what continuous delivery is. Now, when we talk about infrastructure as code, and primarily when we talk about big IPs in CICD pipelines, we really mean continuous deployment in that scenario. So that's really where when the developer updates code, I'm able to push that code out into production and actually impact my production environment, right? So this means maybe I'm building out new types of releases, maybe I'm building out new test environments. I wanna ensure that they're all the same so that when I'm moving through dev test fraud, I don't have a lot of discrepancies between the two of them. Uh, this is how you start to get to multiple releases a day and it heavily, heavily relies upon infrastructure as code. So there's two primary methods that I see used when we talk about continuous delivery, or sorry, continuous deployment. There's blue-green and there's canary. Blue-green, most of them are doing this whether we realize it or not, right? So think of that the blue environment is what my production is today, and green is where I wanna go. 
So I don't mess with the blue environment. I deploy a new green environment and I switch everything to this. For those that have been doing big IP management, this would be you standing up new pool members and downing the old pool members, right? It can be as simple as that. And blue green gave us the ability to say, hey, you know what, if something didn't work in the green environment, I could always fail back to what was working in the blue. Now, what are the caveats of blue-green? Well, the caveats of blue-green is that it's a little slower, right? There's still a lot of manual testing. And that's where Canary is starting to gain a lot of popularity, especially when we talk about things with uh, uh, Kubernetes and containers. It, it makes it pretty simple for the teams to do this. And Canary takes a different approach. Canary says, I want to take an X percentage of my my traffic and split it off into the new environment. So if I am receiving 100 requests per second, then I could take 1% of that, so one request per second, and send it into the new environment. And those users will tell me whether that works or not. Now, they're not actually calling up or filing help desk tickets, right? This is where that monitoring and the telemetry is giving me that continual feedback loop so that I know, wait a minute, the new Canary environment is throwing maybe 500 internal errors, right? or response codes, right? So that internal server error is what it's telling me. So something's wrong with the deployment. Let's steer that 1% back onto our normal production load, go figure out what's wrong, change the code, and we'll try again. And this allows most of our customers to move much, much faster, especially when they're trying to get to multiple releases a day. Canary's typically where they're trying to go. So when we tie them together, right, CI, CD, this gives our developers the ability to move at greater velocity. It allows them to start being uh, essentially uh, an impact into how the business is operating. Now, what we mean by that, if you've heard our uh, uh, general manager over uh, application delivery controllers, uh, Kara's talked about the uh, app capital and where a lot of customers have been moving from, let's say, maybe infrastructure, right? You think of like Ford has factories and lots of trucks and cars, right? That's infrastructure capital. Then you move to like the IBM, which is much uh, heavily driven by people capital. And then now we see that aspect changing to app capital, whether that be applications like Facebook or Uber or APIs, where you know, banks are starting to interact with each other through open APIs and driving business or commoditizing those APIs. And so to move to app capital means that I've got to be faster than everyone else, right? I've got to be faster than my competition. And this is where we start to get into those multiple releases, right? So we've got to remove the burden of that developer so that he's not writing code and then going, okay, I got to wait for production now, right? I've got to wait for someone to approve this task or for security to actually go in and make the firewall changes or heaven forbid the F5 admin takes two to three weeks to configure or get to the point he can configure the virtual server. Let's remove all that complexity. Let's let the development team use the tool that they're using, which is a CI CD pipeline, and actually automate that full process and do it at their speed. Um, now, this is ideal. And, and if you notice, if you've attended sessions one and two, we had massive attendance on those because primarily that's where most people are. Most people are still figuring out automation. If you don't have the automation working yet, then this third step isn't going to be uh, achievable. I'm just trying to be honest, right? If you don't know how to automate every aspect of the infrastructure deployment and the creation of the infrastructure, then CD is always going to fall back down to human speed. And it's gonna be waiting on someone to do something. We want to get all of our automation working and then we can start to integrate it into the continuous deployment. So Jenkins. Um, so Jenkins is uh, one of the most popular uh, automation servers uh, from open source. Uh, there are hundreds of plugins and these plugins are what make Jenkins extremely extensible and easy to use. So if you've attended any type of automation session with F5, you've probably touched Jenkins. If you've used our super NetOps training, uh, class two heavily uses Jenkins. Now class two uses Jenkins to do raw S REST API calls into the big IP. So in that scenario, you're actually creating AS3 declarations and you're using Jenkins to post those directly to the big IP. In today's lab, we're actually using um, Jenkins pipelines. Now why pipelines versus the raw REST codes calls? There's, there's not a wrong or right way, but pipelines are primarily where I see most customers going. And then we're using the pipeline to call Terraform and Ansible, which is our build system 
for this environment. Uh, there are many other tools. We have examples of it working in Azure pipelines. Circle CI is a very popular one. I also use Travis CI for a lot of my open source projects. So don't feel that you have to use Jenkins. If your team is already using another CI tool, more than likely you just need to ask, hey, does it support Ansible? Does it support Terraform? And if it doesn't, most of the CI tools have the ability to spin up a Docker container and you can run all the scripts inside of Docker. So um, the demo today, I wanted to make sure this is something that was repeatable that you could easily use. And so you can definitely go off and build your Jenkins yourself, go grab an image. Uh, it's, it's not terribly difficult, but I have put in the code repository for this webinar, uh, a Terraform and Groovy scripts to actually build out an AWS VPC with the security groups, a new EC2 instance for Jenkins, and then it will configure Jenkins, all the dependencies Jenkins needs, like Terraform, Java, uh, Ansible, uh, and then the PIP modules that we'll need for Ansible. And then it uses a Groovy script to configure some base configurations for Jenkins. So this way, when you go into the Jenkins GUI for the first time, you can close the wizard because everything's been configured and start building your pipeline. The other thing is the example code that we're using today, we are defining the pipelines using Groovy inside of code repository as well. So this makes it easier to kind of just get up and running without having to become necessarily a Jenkins expert. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with actually understanding the tool that you're using, but a lot of times in demos, and especially when you try to reproduce this in your home environment, you wanna move quickly. You wanna be able to say, wow, this is cool. Now let me go digest and break down what it's doing. So pipelines and webhooks. Pipelines, uh, think of it as an automated process. Primarily what we're doing in the pipelines is we're getting code out of a code repository. We're then building the required environment. So for us today, that means building out a Ubuntu server. We're going to install the Nginx demo application, and then we're gonna go build an F5 um, based upon an AMI, an Amazon machine image. So it'll create its own EC2 image, and then we'll configure those um, so that we're using Ansible. And then we're gonna, you know, normally you'd be doing this in a test environment in a prod, and then you could also have the pipeline building out blue, green, or canaries, right? Pipelines are also very powerful in the sense that you can also have them doing unit tests or, or additional testing uh, to make sure that the environment is up and running. Ideally, we want the pipeline to run through a process that no one has to touch. If there is a process where we have to fall back and say, hey, Cody needs to actually go view the web app, and make sure it's running, then the pipeline has the ability to pause itself and say, hey, you gotta come back and click proceed, right? What we don't wanna really do is finish a pipeline and then the pipeline finishes and we're saying someone still has to do something because guess what? Inevitably, that won't happen. And you'll see that a pipeline finished, you'll think that you're in production, you should be good, and we're not where we wanna be, right? The other thing we wanna make sure is we have multiple developers, they could potentially trigger multiple pipelines at the same time. So Jenkins has the ability to configure itself so that only one pipeline can run at any given time. And if another pipeline's in a waiting state, the newer pipeline will precede that, right? And this is really what you probably wanna do in production. In development, that's fine. They can all be running different pipelines, but in production, we wanna make sure that there's only one milestone, that we're only deploying one instance at a time and the latest deployment would typically always win. We also wanna ensure our pipelines are primarily building off of master in production. When we talk about code repositories, most of the developers should be working in branches. So if I'm writing a new feature into an application, I may create Kodi branch feature one, two, three, right? But then once I've gone through my CI testing and everything works as expected, I then merge that into the master branch and that's what would kick off the pipeline. So leading to the next thing, and I, I'm sorry, I kind of skipped ahead. <laughs> Let me hold off on the workflow in a minute. But uh, one of the things I do want to emphasize here is uh, Jenkins pipelines can be procedural or declarative. And if you're new to Jenkins and you're Googling around trying to figure out, well, hey, how do I do this? How do I do that? You have to make sure that you're looking at examples that match what you're doing. I know this because I ran into the same problem myself, right? So if you're basing everything upon procedural, make sure that the examples you're following are procedural. If you're doing declarative, make sure it's declarative. You could typically achieve this by just adding on procedural or declarative into your Google search, but it's something we want to make sure that we're doing. Um, I did mention you can configure Jenkins through the GUI or through Groovy scripts. Um, in this particular demo, we will, uh, I've already gone through the GUI, right? I used the GUI to quickly iterate on what the pipeline configuration should be. And then once it was somewhere that I liked, I then took that pipeline configuration, it's a Groovy script, and I moved that into the code repository. 
And then I configured the pipeline to go look in the repository for the pipeline configuration. So this makes it very easy for others to import not only my code, but the actual Jenkins pipeline that I was using. Now, I talked about the code being updated, right? When we update the code, how do we fire off a new procedure? So this is where webhooks come into play. Um, for this demo, I'm using GitHub. Uh, and so you can use GitHub, you can use GitHub Enterprise. Almost every major code repository today supports some form of a webhook. And think of it as it's a way to remotely trigger a pipeline or trigger some type of event. The goal here would be that when we check in a new or we update new code inside of our application repository, the webhook is gonna tell uh, Jenkins, hey, go start this process. Now, the nice thing is Jenkins can actually automate all of this for you. So if you're unfamiliar with how to configure webhooks and you're using GitHub, you can provide your GitHub credentials and Jenkins will actually go in and set up the webhooks itself. The other thing is in this particular example, I do have two pipelines, and this is my personal preference. It's really up to you how you would deploy it, but I like my infrastructure pipeline to be separate from my code pipeline. And one of the things this allows me to do is that infrastructure pipeline could be used by multiple projects. So in today's demo, I'm actually using a single NIC big IP with a Nginx demo, right? That's my pipeline for infrastructure. And then the app just simply has the configuration and the actual code for Nginx. And I'll show you an example of that real quick. So if I skip over, I'm going to stop sharing and switch my window. So in, um, I'm going to skip to my CICD demo app. So in this example, I have my HTML. And this is just the Nginx demo application that you can find in their GitHub repository. They have it as a Docker container, but um, you know, we're doing some labs in what we call a unified demo framework, and the UDF doesn't support Docker or native uh, ECS instances in AWS yet. So I'm just building this inside of an EC2 image, pretty easy. Um, I also have my configurations. There again, it's just telling Nginx to set these variables so we can display them on the page. Now, the other things that we see in here is I have my Jenkins file. And so this is how I'm configuring Jenkins, right? So my build processes. Um, I also have a pipeline. And so, um, you know, one of the things I'm hoping to provide y'all probably in the next week or two is a fully automated test lab, right? What I want to do is actually have you walk through Ansible, walk through hands-on with Terraform, and then walk through hands-on with uh, Jenkins. So kind of giving you a more detailed lab over the three-part webinar that we've done. So let's skip back to the presentation. Now, the build environment. Um, so when you say build environment to your developers, they're probably thinking of something like Maven or you know, building up their uh, applications. For us, it's really Terraform and Ansible. And so we're using both because they shine in different areas. Ansible is really, really good at configuration management. Um, hundreds or thousands, I don't know if they're up to thousands, but there's hundreds of modules that make it easy to integrate Ansible with other services. But Terraform, Terraform is really good at state. And this is why when you talk about infrastructure as code, you often hear people reference Terraform because Terraform is building out the infrastructure and maintaining the state of that infrastructure. So the uh, analogy, I guess the difference would be that Terraform is always looking for a state file, whether that's locally or that's stored inside of something like an S3 bucket, which is what we're doing in this demo. And so that S3 bucket is containing our data. And so Terraform always knows, hey, I've got a Nginx server built. I already have a big IP server built. And if he detects drift, so for example, I could say, well, I need to add a new uh, IP to my security group. Terraform would detect that there's drift there and he would update it. Ansible, on the other hand, typically is always going to the device and trying to do like a gather facts. He's trying to determine, should he run this script or not, right? There's no state that Ansible is necessarily maintaining itself. So why do we use both? Well, Ansible is primarily one of the most popular automation tools that, that I see on the market today. Um, it's agentless, which for the big IP is very powerful because we don't want something installing an agent on the big IP itself. Um, and it makes automation tasks very easy. So there's an example in today we're using the Nginx Ansible uh, role. And basically we define the role and it takes care of everything else. It installs Nginx, it configures the base deployment. All we had to do was a few lines of code. 
but that's pretty easy. That's really what I want to be doing, right? I don't want to be writing a lot of raw shell commands, which is what I'd have to do in Terraform. However, Terraform is much better at building out my infrastructure. So in the labs or in the demo today, we're really using Terraform to go build out the EC2 instances, build out the VPCs, build out the IMM roles, all of this stuff that really needs to be maintained as far as the state. And so that state stored in an S3 bucket and it's something I can always reference. The other thing I'm also having Terraform do is because this is an ephemeral environment, Terraform maintains all my passwords. Now in the demo today, we're doing passwords in the Terraform state. My S3 bucket is encrypted, but theoretically anyone that has admin rights to my account could go read the S3 bucket. For the demo, that's ac acceptable, right? In a production environment, you may actually wanna look at things like Vault. Um, so that you know, anyone with an admin account couldn't read the encrypted S3 bucket and you could store your credentials somewhere else. So for those that are new today, we're achieving the automation of the big IP using the F5 automation tool chain. Now, the F5 automation tool chain is a free offering from F5. It's part of your maintenance contract and it gives you configuration tools to both deploy and configure an F5 using declarative APIs. There are a couple of components, cloud templates, are templatized methods of deploying the big IP in AWS, Azure, GCP, and then we have declarative onboarding. This is where you can do a declarative API call to configure things like the networking interfaces, licensing, clustering, making it very easy to have the big IP up and ready to accept an application configuration. The one that's most popular that many of you may already be familiar with is AS3, or Application Service 3 Extension. AS3 is a declarative API to actually configure your application. So this is where we can make one API call and configure all components of our app. Now, there's the API services gateway. So if you want to run all of these in a Docker container or, <clears throat> pardon me, you want to abstract it off of the big IP, the API service gateway gives you that capability. Essentially, it's a proxy for those declarative API calls. And this is advantageous for customers because if you have SLAs and maybe you're only allowed to install or update software on the big IP during maintenance windows, that impedes how fast you can add new features and automation. Versus if we can install the tool chain in the API gateway or in Docker containers, those can be upgraded at will. They don't have to go through the same SLAs as the big IP. Now, telemetry streaming is how we get data off the big IP and provide that continuous feedback loop to the developer. Um, one of the key benefits of using these declarative APIs, especially AS3 versus imperative APIs, is that uh, AS3 gives you a schema contract. So what we're saying is for an X number of years, we guarantee that this schema, right, the declaration that you're providing us, will deploy the same application across any environment. So for a lot of our pay customers, they're, one of some of their biggest pain points are upgrades because the big IP is the source of truth in that configuration. And so they have to be very careful with the big IP. When we start to abstract out the source of truth and let's say store it in a GitHub repository, and we use things like AS3 to then configure the app, this makes upgrades very, very easy because now the AS3 schema contract is guaranteeing that the same configuration would deploy in any version of TMOS that AS3 supports. So if I'm on 12.1, I move to 13.1, I move to 14.1, I move to 15.1, that declaration will deploy the same app every time. And this is very nice when we're talking about automation, especially when we're trying to integrate with the CI pipeline. So let's kind of jump into a demo and see what's going on. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, ask them in the Q&A section. I'll pause periodically and, uh, and answer that. So I'm gonna go ahead and share out my web top again, or my um, browser. I'll make this a little bigger for y'all. Now, what I have here is if you've been following along, we have the automation webinar uh, GitHub repository. Inside I have code. And then since we're in the third webinar, that's our CI CD process. There's a couple things going on here. Uh, we have our Jenkins file, and this is really telling us how to build out the pipeline. So if I was new to Jenkins, this is how I would easily just tell Jenkins, go grab your configuration from my code repository. Now, what are we doing in here? There's a couple things. We are defining, uh, defining our path. Um, we're also setting a couple of variables. And so in this case, I'm getting the name um, either from an environment variable or I'm setting it to a default because the name is used by some of my Terraform and Ansible scripts. I need to ensure that it's always set. 
Now, the other thing I'm doing is a GitHub repository. So again, I'm either receiving the GitHub repository as a parameter to the pipeline, right? That's what this params.app name is doing. Um, or if I don't, then it's my demo, right? So go to a default repository. Now, the first stage we're going to perform here is actually to clone the repository. So what I want to do is check out the repository, and, and you'll notice I hard-coded that in. I shouldn't. This should be GitHub repo URLs. The, the fun stuff you notice when you're uh, demoing, right? So I will update that. Uh, but this is, the goal here is to grab the code so that we can then execute all of our Terraform and Ansible scripts. The next stage is to deploy our web app and big IP. So I'm deploying or I'm issuing a directory command because in Jenkins, when it's, it's talking to the underlying um, operating system, if I was to do a CD in one of these shell commands here, the next shell command doesn't go back into that folder. Uh, Jenkins always runs its commands inside of uh, its processing or workspace for this particular pipeline. So if I provide a directory command up here, then all steps inside of that directory command follow or work inside of that same uh, workspace. So what we're doing is we're exporting the name. Uh, we're then doing some of our Terraform commands. Now, one of the things that's new that you didn't see last time is the Terraform git update. I'll show you that here in a minute. But in webinar two, we were using Terraform modules that were in the same code repository that we were working out of. In this class, we're actually referencing Terraform modules that live in other GitHub repositories. Because I really don't want to be copying my modules around. I'd rather have a central place that I write and update my modules, and then all my independent scripts or Terraform uh, scripts are, are referencing that. So for example, if I fix a bug in my EC2 deployment, they all benefit from it versus me having to go to each repository, update that same bug. Now, Terraform init is pulling down all the modules that we need or providers that we need for this particular instance. And then, of course, from last time, Terraform apply auto approve. So in this particular stage, we should deploy our uh, Linux servers and we should deploy our big IP. Now, once they're up and running, we actually want to configure our web app. So this is where we're, again, changing into the webinar three directory and then we're issuing our playbook. Now, our playbook needs some variables that we have to define. So in this case, we're adding in some extra variables, that name that we defined earlier in our pipeline, and then the GitHub repo that we're defining earlier in our pipeline. So this makes it easy for me to pass variables that the pipeline is either creating or variables that were given to the pipeline down into Ansible and Terraform. And then the last stage is I want to configure the big IP. Now that my apps are up and running, um, now we can start to do this. I'll be honest, I ran into a couple of challenges here. And so I had to play around with some of the configurations. If you have some experience and you think that there's a better way to do this, I'd love to hear it, right? Make a comment on GitHub or you know, do a, an issue because I'm by no means saying this is the only way. Uh, it's just the way that, that I found worked. Now, uh, in this particular environment, because the EC2 instances are all spun up dynamically, there's one problem. And as a security guy, I'm not fond of this but there's no way to accept the key from the server. So most of the examples I see about running Ansible inside of a CI pipeline, they tell you to ignore host key checking. So there again, perfectly okay for a demo environment, but I, I, this is one of the things I wanna ask some of my uh, counterparts in Ansible, is there a better way to do this? Um, we're then towing, uh, calling our Ansible playbook and we're passing in some new variables this time. We're passing in the big IP password, we're passing in the big IP and we're passing in our SSH key file because uh, Ansible needs to SSH into the big IP to change its password. Now, in this particular scenario, we're using a feature inside of Linux that allows me to escape out of a command and run another command. So we're doing a Terraform output. So my Terraform scripts are actually storing the output of the big IP's uh, private IP address and the big IP's password. Now you'll see up here, I was trying to set those through shell commands, but Jenkins doesn't uh, let you necessarily put new variables or environment variables inside of the step. So this is one of those I, I wanna follow back up on and see if there's a better way to do this because while this does achieve what we're after, this is not declarative, right? This could potentially cause problems and we'd rather be using variables because a variable can always be overwritten. So this particular pipeline uh, is built out over here. If I go back into Jenkins 
and I can see that I have two uh, jobs. The first is test. And this one, if I go to the, uh, let's see, configure. What we did is we told uh, Jenkins that the repository is our automation webinar. And then we told him to configure himself via the uh, Jenkins file, right? Now, if we go back into our uh, actual web app and this one, now we're doing the automation webinar. Let's see, there's a question, one second. Uh, Jenkins calling the shell commands, it's a bit long, but you could just make it all one call with semicolons between calls. Yeah, um, and, and you can, right? It's a demo, so some of the things are stretched out, so Jenkins looks a little prettier. <laughs> Um, but in this case, we're actually telling it, okay, now pull the Jenkins file, but look for it in this particular script path. And so this is helpful when I have a repository that stores multiple projects. Uh, having done development with GitHub for quite, many, you know, for quite a few years, I I'm really on the fence, right? When you have a big project, you store it in one repo, do you break it up in multiple repos? That really is dependent upon your organization and what you feel comfortable with. But this is how I would do it. If I was in a large repo and maybe my project was a subfolder of that repo, I just tell Jenkins where to go find it. But keep in mind, Jenkins is checking out that root folder. All right, so if we go back to this um, and we actually dig in to our branch, um, I've got a couple of builds that have been failing. I've got a couple of builds that are correct. Uh, number 70 is actually the one that built out my environment. Now, number 70 failed, and I'll show you why in a minute. So as we come back into the um, pipeline configuration, you're seeing that we have a stage deploy web app. If I jump back over to Jenkins, we have deploy web app and big IP. We come back into this, it says configure web app. We come back into Jenkins. So you see how those stages are being processed. You can also at any point in time come in and view the logs for that particular stage. Um, so this is helpful when you're trying to troubleshoot. Now let's actually see what Jenkins is doing. So if I come back in and I say, all right, um, it's going to be running my Terraform, that's one of the first things it's doing, and main.tf. So in main.tf, there's a couple things that we're doing. We're storing our state file in an S3 bucket, and then I need to get the public IP address so that I can ensure that my security groups allow it. I'm creating a password for the big IP. Because this is an ephemeral environment, there's no reason I should be setting the password to a common admin password, right? We're past the point of pets. These are cattle, right? We're not naming them. We don't care and feed for them. If it doesn't work, we simply blow it away and redeploy. Um, I need to find my VPC. Because I've already built the VPC as part of my setup, this script is gonna look for a pre-existing VPC. Um, that's what's happening in these two. It's telling it the region, and then it's telling it the CIDR block and the name that the VPC should be called. And mind you, it's a var name, so this is getting pulled from the pipeline. Um, we're deploying our demo app. So in this scenario, I am pulling the compute module from another GitHub repository. And so this is the benefit of being able to reuse my Terraform code. So what's happening here is GitHub Cody Green Terraform is a GitHub repository for all my Terraform scripts. This double slash tells Terraform not to go look in the root of that repository, but to go look for a particular folder inside of that repository. So now I can easily reuse this compute EC2 anytime I want. You can as well you can actually pull this con these few lines right here and it would deploy out an EC2 instance for you. There's a couple things I'm defining. We need the name, VPC ID, the SSH key that's built out inside of my AWS environment, and then how many I'm looking to deploy. Because it's a demo environment, we're just doing one. Um, the next thing we're doing is deploying our big IP. Uh, I fell back to CFT. I do have examples that don't require CFT. It's commented out right here. And uh, the reason is that there is a bug in 14.1 when deployed through AWS that I was running into. So that bug's being addressed right now, it's getting fixed. And so the CloudFormation still deploys a 13.1 image. Um, so what we're doing here is we're setting our image name, our instance type, we're restricting our um, addresses for the management. 
So only my uh, VPC is allowed to make API calls into the big IP. But for my applications, I'm going to allow anyone. And then my declaration URL, this is where I can pull in an AS3 declaration. Uh, if you look at this example right here, this is how I could build out with Terraform an EC2 instance for the big IP. When using Terraform, this is actually my preferred method. I prefer to do this because Terraform and CloudFormation templates kind of step on each other, right? They're, they're kind of trying to achieve the same thing. And there's very little that I couldn't do in Terraform that, that CloudFormation would be able to give me. There are some differences. CFT uh, has some capabilities that Amazon has not put in their Terraform provider. But for the most part, I prefer to use Terraform natively. And then um, we also have um, inside of our Terraform repository, or sorry, Terraform's GitHub for the F5 provider, we actually have an AS3 uh, instance now. So if you wanna play with the latest version, you could go grab that and actually deploy AS3 declarations through Terraform. It's not available in the public release of our provider, but it is available if you download the code and compile the, the uh, provider yourself. All right, so we've gone through the pipeline, we've gone through the Terraform. Let's see what uh, Ansible is doing. So demo app is coming in and he is installing Nginx. So we're doing this by the Nginx role. And then post tasks, he's gonna check out my code repository and he's gonna put it in the SVR uh, checkout folder. Um, I then am telling Ansible to copy the website. So remember, we had the HTML index.html, which is back here, that index.html. And so Ansible is copying that to the Nginx uh, uh, website page. So html.index.html, there is already the demo app there, we're simply overwriting it. Because this demo app shows you things like the client IP address and it can do auto refreshing. We're also sending in the Nginx configuration. Again, if you remember, that configuration is pretty basic, but it is setting some variables that the demo app needs, such as server name, address, URL, date, and ID. And then finally, it's restarting the process. So not a very difficult Ansible script, um, but trying to do all of this with Terraform, you would be essentially issuing shell commands. Um, and I'm just not a huge fan of that, right? This is a much cleaner way to do configuration management. Now, when we look at the big IP, we're configured big IP with Ansible. There's a couple things that are happening here. We're changing the password of the big IP and we're passing that in from Terraform because Terraform is maintaining that in thermal state. We're installing the AS3 declaration. So anything pre 13 or 14 one, uh, AS3 long-term support had not been released. So it's not part of the base image. And this scenario, we're actually putting in the AS3 uh, deck or uh, we're putting in the AS3 iControlX extension and we're doing that by the Git URL. And so we can pull, I'm sorry, we can download it and then we're doing the big IP IAPLX package to install it. Um, then we're pushing our declaration out there. Now earlier, if you remember, this was my deployment, why is it red? So man, something didn't work. I can come over to this job, number 70, and I can look at console output. And so if I scroll all the way to the bottom, this is everything that uh, Terraform and Ansible is doing. But if I scroll down here to the bottom, what I'm seeing is that my uh, commands to AS3 failed. So I've got an error here, right? And this is something I need to fix. What it is, is if I come back over to my uh, Ansible script, we are trying to post declaration right after we installed AS3. Well, guess what? The big IP needs a couple seconds to actually restart its node instance and have AS3 accepting declarations. So one of the things I need to do after the lab here, or the demo, is I actually need to add another step that goes and queries AS3's API to say, hey, are you ready? Are you good to go? And then once I add that in, you'll see that this won't fail. Uh, so we have a question from Adam. So just to clarify, Ansible isn't calling Terraform and Terraform isn't calling Ansible. Jenkins manages both of these pieces and calls them separately. Yeah, I, for me, that was the better method. I mean, I've got Jenkins doing the automation. Why have Terraform call Ansible or Ansible call Terraform? If I wasn't using Jenkins, and if you've attended lab or webinar two, we actually had Terraform calling Ansible. Um, but with Jenkins kind of being in that overarching control, I'd rather him do that. 
It also allows me to do uh, like key management. So if Jenkins is storing my passwords, then Jenkins could then supply them to both Terraform and Ansible. There's no right or wrong way here. It's what is, you know, works best for you. So you saw why I was getting the error. So I needed a couple seconds in between the point that we installed AS3 to the point that we wrote the declaration to AS3. And so what we did is we ran the pipeline again. And now if we come to 71, we see that everything was successful. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we'll see that our declaration succeeded. So what we can do now, this is our big IP. I'm just gonna copy his IP address. And of course, demo gods are not with me. So let's rerun the declaration, see what happened. Should kick off uh, 72. We'll give that a minute. Any other questions while this um, goes through a deployment? All right, I'm gonna check my EC2 instance while that's happening. We've got our big IP. Make sure my IP address is correct. Yep, that's the problem. I am talking to the wrong IP address. <laughs> so there's that. And if you wanna make sure it actually is the big IP, we add on the 8443 for the single instance management. And I need to give it the HTTPS. Uh, so a question came in, if we just require webhooks to our use case to connect Git with Ansible and Terraform, then Jenkins won't be needed. Um, so you're absolutely correct. There is a uh, example on F5's, I believe it's the Dev Central code repository, um, where we are doing webhooks uh, from GitHub directly into the big IP. And this uses a new iControlX extension that one of our architects wrote, and it's community supported. But what the webhook is doing is calling that iControlX extension and then he's coming back to GitHub and saying, hey, show me what's changed and I'll see if one of those is an AS3 declaration. If it is an AS3 declaration, then I'll run that declaration and update the app. Um, so uh, so that there's, there's definitely Jenkins is not required. Uh, Jenkins is really more about that CI and then the CD deployment. If you can do continuous deployment another way, by all means, use what's best for you. Uh, it's just this is one of the more popular ways that, that we see. And so uh, the Nginx app is working. Um, I cannot get to my big IP because if you remember inside of my security groups, I'm actually locking it down to my VPC. Uh, I, this, isn't, this is an external IP address. So the uh, AWS security groups are locking down access to my big IP. Th ideally, that would be okay, right? Because if we're deploying and this is really a pet or, you know, it's not, it's, sorry, this is not a pet. I'm not naming it. I'm not carrying it, feeding it. I really shouldn't be logging into the GUI. It should be a cattle approach. It should be automated. It should be always updated through automation. But the Nginx demo is telling us that the IP address is 10.0.1.180 and then the date and the URL that we're requesting. And then I can, of course, auto refresh this. And if you had multiple Nginx uh, demo apps and you had um, round robining configured, you could see it go between this. So the nice thing about this is, is you could now come into your code repository. And if I skip back up to the root, um, I could come into main.tf and I could change the number of instances. I could also come back over here and this is the AS3 declaration. I could come in here and change how I'm doing uh, persistence. Now, one of the things I do wanna point out real quick and I'll answer the questions coming in on chat is I did not ask Terraform for the IP addresses of the uh, Nginx demo app. If, and the reason I didn't do that is I wanted to show you the service discovery capability inside of AS, inside of uh, AS3, which works for AWS, uh, Azure, and GCP. So what we're doing here is we're telling the big IP, go query the AWS API and look for a key tag. For me, when I deploy my app, I set the, the tag to scale group and I set the value to lab. So any EC2 instance that spins up with that key and that value, they'll automatically be added to the big IP pool. So this gives me a way to dynamically put pool members in and I'm not having to always go 
and figure out what's happened. Why is that advantageous? In this CI lab, we manually deployed an EC2 instance as our Nginx demo. What I really see in production environments is customers would then have uh, Terraform or Ansible take that single image and create a unique uh, AMI out of it and then create an auto scale group that launches that AMI, right? So in that type of scenario, Ansible and Terraform really don't know the IP addresses anymore because we're now relying upon AWS to scale that app based upon demand or failure. If we use the tagging as AWS scaling groups add or remove uh, members, we learn about those automatically. So let's, let's get some of the questions going on here. William asks, going back to my comment earlier, looking at the bottom of the Jenkins shell command calls, was the issue with the uh, commented commands that each call is starting a new shell? Oh, so I'm losing my variables. Um, yeah, William, that, that's something I probably need to look into. I did try putting them all on uh, one line and I, I didn't have a lot of luck there. So uh, by all means, if you have some recommendations, please let me know. I, I, I'm not uh, trying to proclaim that I'm a, a Jenkins expert. So I, I do appreciate that input. Uh, Christopher said, I'm getting jittery and delay issues here. I'll have to listen to the recording later. So Christopher, sorry about that. Uh, there is a bug that Zoom has been working on for uh, the webinar series. They found that some people are getting downgraded to 320 instead of 720 quality. And so we were told that that should have been fixed. Um, if you're seeing some issues, I apologize, maybe it was not. So Clem uh, is asking, are there any best practice guidelines on how to structure the various Git repositories when managing hundreds of applications that may be deployed over 50 plus different F5 pairs? Uh, Clem, I, I would tell you no. Um, the problem about the GitHub structures is that it really depends for your, your environment and what works for you. I, I think what we could do is you know, we could take a look and, and try to give you a recommendation or how I would do it, but we haven't necessarily come out and said, you know, thou shall structure this way because we ultimately find that everyone's a unique snowflake and it's easier to just simply say, figure out the structure and then we can figure out the pipeline to that structure. So sorry, not the answer you're looking for, but um, that, that is that's, that's, that's not one size fits all. Uh, Jason asked, is the AS3 polling an AA of AWS better than using FQDNs with auto-populate to detect pull member changes. So Jason, in a cloud environment, I would say yes, because the TTL of the uh, DNS polling, which is when we're doing the fully qualified domain name service discovery, we're polling DNS. We're really reliant upon whatever our LDNS is between us and that environment. Now, um, in AWS, if you're using something like Route 53, you can set that TTL very low. So you could probably achieve the same type of SLA that we have with service discovery, but we find that service discovery picks up the new or removed instances faster than uh, FQDN or DNS service discovery does. That being said, tagging doesn't work inside of like AWS ECS, which is their managed cluster, uh, a container cluster. Um, in that scenario, I have to use FQDN. And I can typically find a node that's been added or removed in about 10 seconds. We're talking 10 seconds, right? I mean, if, if, if everything boils down to something breaking in 10 seconds, then, then I would say we, we want to lean towards the API. Uh, Adam asks, I didn't notice any use of the Big IP Terraform provider. Can you briefly compare, contrast the Ansible modules for managing the F5 versus the Terraform provider modules? So you, you also won't notice me using any Ansible modules other than to install the iControl LX. The reason is, is we're really trying to push our customers towards using our declarative APIs. When we talk about the Terraform provider and the uh, Ansible F5 module, they're all based upon our imperative APIs. Now, that being said, the next release of Terraform, and well, hopefully the next release of Terraform, but definitely the next release of Ansible, uh, you will see some of our declarative APIs uh, now included in either roles or uh, the provider. So what we want is we want you to start using that schema contract. By using the declarative APIs, we can guarantee that that app deploys the same way every time. When you use our imperative APIs, it's still upon you to go validate that between version 13 and 14, your commands still work or your program didn't deviate in a configuration on the virtual server. And so we're really trying to push towards those AS3 declarations. Now, I'll be honest, 
where do we see people using the Terraform provider and or using the Ansible modules? We see them heavily used in Brownfield. So we're working on ways to help customers move Brownfield into declarative APIs. And hopefully early this summer, I'll have an update for you there. All right. Um, let's see, any more questions? All right. Well, everyone, I appreciate your time today. If you do find a question, you all have my email address. Please feel free to shoot me an email. Happy to answer them. Um, I will be updating the code repository to fix some of the issues I saw going through this webinar. And uh, feel free to run it yourself. And if you find a bug, hey, you know, pull a, uh, do a GitHub issue or do a pull request. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get things going and, and use development processes to try to get through this. Um, so anyway, can you get a copy of the webinar? Yes. Uh, uh, there will be an email that Zoom will send out tomorrow. It's 24 hours after this. And it will have a link to the recording, a link to the GitHub repository, and a link to the presentation. Um, I'll also include all of the same information for the first uh, webinar and the second webinar. So, all right, everyone, thank you for your time and have a great day. Bye-bye.